Um, hello and welcome um, to the Sweet Series, uh, lead, Leading from Lockdown. We're on episode five. Um, my name is Michael Donald, and together with our friends at Wolf, um, we've created the Sweet Series to try and help spark some conversation and innovation with our friends and colleagues in the industry. Um, COVID-19 has introduced, introduced us um, to the three-day week. I don't know if you've come across that one before. Um, yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And I hope that this, set, um, this session might help inspire someone um, to refocus on preparing for those opportunities that no doubt will start coming to maybe tomorrow. Um, please let me introduce you to Andrew Wolf, um, who will introduce the rest of the panel. Thank you. Hi folks, welcome. Uh, my name's Andrew Wolf. I run a brand design agency called Wolf. We specialize in the hospitality sector um, and interesting times for us in terms of helping companies deal with what future might look like and that's very much part of what we we offer our clients as well as uh, basic tactical brand design solutions um, i'll run through quickly introductions uh, on my right and i'm not sure where on everyone else's screen is dr wei chen um, wei is a senior lecturer in internationalization of hospitality at sheffield hallam university yeah. and we were just discussing that internationalization of hospitality might have to change to regionalization or staycations or something mm -hmm. like that interesting times welcome wei Thanks. Um, below is um, Bob, or do you prefer to be called Robert? Um, Very relaxed. You're listed as uh, Bob, but Robert Walton, MBE, President of the Restaurant Association of Great Britain and founder of the Nth Degree Club, which offers extraordinarily unique culinary experiences and benefits private members. Robert, welcome. Um, Thank you. Nice to have you here. Uh, David, who's muted at the moment, but welcome, David. Uh, you're Assistant Director of HR at the Carlton Tower Jumeira and the Jumeira Lounge Hotel in Knightsbridge. And previously, you're a Starwood person, I believe. Yeah. So our uh, paths might have crossed, and no doubt that's where you met Michael as well. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're quite quiet, David. I don't know if there's a volume issue at your end. Okay. Um, John Lee, welcome John. Uh, John is uh, also here in Edinburgh um, and is partner at Leddingham Chalmers lawyer, law firm specialising in discrimination and employment law across many sectors including hospitality. Uh, welcome joining us at very short notice John to fill in a, a gap we had in our schedule. Thank you and last but not least is David. David, welcome. Uh, having previously represented Tourism Ireland and Visit Britain, David is Director of Partner Marketing at the Travel Corporation and operates with a strong understanding of the travel industry landscape. So you're all very welcome and I'll hand it back to Chairman without any further ado. Thank you very much and thank you all for joining us. Um, I would like to ask a, quite a general question to start off with, uh, we'll act as a bit of an intro to, to each of you, but what have been your biggest challenges over the past couple of months and what have you been doing um, to try and overcome them and maybe we'll start that question with David Morrison please yeah I, th I think for me it was just remarkable how quickly uh, this went from wanting to know where colleagues have been going on holidays and that sort of thing to understand the risks around COVID-19 to where we got to at the end of March which was the complete sort of shutdown of the office I think it, it, it went so so quickly and required mm -hmm. us to move move so quickly in how we were reading the situation and then and then managing it and I think from there, the, the sheer volume of work just picked up extraordinarily quickly. And uh, we talk a lot about having um, or being in a, a VUCA landscape, which is you know, volatile, uncertain, and complex and ambiguous. And that really, really became a, a, you know, a, a huge is issue for us um, you know, in, in, the, in the early spring when this really did go, did go quickly. And I think for me, lots of my challenges that I faced from an HR perspective were um, telling people they had been furloughed and how, how to have those conversations because it's quite, quite challenging. I think that the constantly changing legislative environment where you had HMRC updates every single uh, week, normally on a Friday afternoon, where there'd been a different spin on, on, on how they were um, asking us to interpret their, their rules. Um, I think that in many ways, actually working together as an HR team using a new technology helped us in many ways in, in managing that, that, that um, extremely quick uh, release of information and how to best to deal with it. Um, I think also from there, the, there were complexities too around actually the furlough pra pragmatically itself. So making sure the payroll was run correctly for, for, our, for our employees at such an important time, um, managing all different scenarios of, of, around the furlough, some people working, some people not, not working. And I think a, a lot of it did rely on us having a great, a great team and, and great strong relationships um, mm -hmm. in that team. So for me, the, the one, on the one hand was the, the pragmatic 
issues around you know what following meant because of the COVID progression and then from there it became, it became more about the duty, the duty of care um, I would with colleagues too and there obviously are issues around uh, problems with isolation and new ways of working and the lack of face-to-face -face and all those social cues that you rely on so much when you're with other people and mm -hmm. then also for me I have a three-year-old son and working with him too it, it, you know, it was challenging for the time before I was I was I was furloughed personally um, but there are lots of interesting things that you, you see if you, if you google now what's out there and for example there's advice around um, manage, managers checking in with colleagues more frequently lots of suggestions around doing more town hall meetings Microsoft have an amazing um, deck of, of, of slides they use, uh, which is a whole guide to how to work from home uh, with, with COVID-19, uh, which is really remarkable to, to, have, to have a look at. Um, I think that, you know, having friends at work is a key driver of employee engagement. So how can, how can we leverage this? I think a big focus for us um, as an HR team has been how we can continue those, those relationships with, with colleagues, because that's how people will continue to one way they would yeah. Engage in business. So I, think I could talk for ages on this. I think it's lost. <laughs> yeah. Things, but I think if I could split it into two, it would be the, the pragmatism around the furloughing, the payroll, the HMRC requirement, and then the duty of care side of things. Um, as yeah. well. All with the changing goalposts. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Um, Robert. Mm. I think it's really interesting, David, really interesting hearing because we come from a, uh, although I sort of sit on the Restaurant Association, which is under the umbrella of of UKH, UK Hospitality, we have a, a call every week now with probably people representing two to 300 restaurants. Uh, the chairman is David Lowy, so we have the D&D group, and it's really interesting to see there. By the way, this week, with the furloughing scheme being extended, and with the sort of gentle start from July, there was the first sort of upbeat feel to the conversation mm. than we had for for the last sort of seven weeks or so um it, and it is amazing how we all adapt really quickly to the circumstances you know like this zoom you know i'm loving zoom i'm <laughs> loving sitting here at home and not having to travel on the trains every five minutes um and i've got a call straight after this with michelin i work very very closely well i run the michelin revelation so that in itself so for my how things have changed from my side well it's very much on on the event side of things well they they're going to be one of the last areas that are going to come out of this because as we as we know as we slowly go it looks like outside spaces the same as different parts of europe and and then slowly we'll get inside and then once we get inside we may be able to get gatherings but that's obviously a little bit further down the line so um but how have they all adapted? Well, they all seem to be pretty positive. I run the Tatler Restaurant Awards as well, and that uh, they we had a conversation with them. Nothing's going to change apart from the date. Um, and the date really is very difficult to say when that's going to be just yet. But everyone's very keen that things carry on as opposed to, well, we'll have to counsel all that. And I felt that's really a positive vibe, you know, by all of these big groups but equally they don't want them the, the michelin guide doesn't want to launch a michelin guide uh not that i have anything to do with launching the michelin guide i just actually look after the the event itself um so i think that what we've seen is is we have as david said it was a just a, a turn off a tap turned off one day you were into a venue the next day you were not allowed in we haven't been allowed in for for seven eight weeks now so it is a slow, slow way we're going to get out of it. I love the way we've all adapted. We actually have just launched, we're launching tomorrow, Young Chef, Young Waiter, yes. uh, which, is an, which we adapted last year, not to be COVID proof. We adapted it to be uh, a, a, an up-to-date, modern online competition where chefs have zero time to suddenly wander around to different locations. We used to go to Scotland years ago, by the way, Andrew, um, with a dear friend of mine called James Thompson, whoever's in Scotland, James Thompson. Are you, yeah, in Edinburgh, yeah. Um, but now, of course, with the online technology, everyone can judge and the chefs can judge online. And so we launched this tomorrow and we believe we're gonna be, have a record number of applications. Now, we don't quite know when the final will be, 
it's due to be November the 17th. And at the moment, that is the plan. But we can adapt it, just yeah. like we can adapt the Michelin Revelation or the Tatler Restaurant Awards or whatever else it is that we're involved in and running. And I think that, and I think everyone ex accepts that. Nobody's saying, well, you said it's going to be this day. Mm -hmm. So we have our plan. We have a plan which is exactly as it will run. Uh, and I'm very, very, and I'm also, um, one thing that you hopefully see in the press mm -hmm. release that comes out tomorrow through the caterer is that we're also going to be doing a Chinese young chef, young waiter, and one I call South Asia, which is Indian, Bangladesh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're going to bring in those communities as well, because those two communities need just as much uh, help, assistance, and positive sort of vibes than, 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 if you like, the classic young chef, young waiter group. So mm -hmm. I think, it, it, as David said, everything just got turned off but it's how we adapt and how we go through and how hotels will adapt as we go through. I know obviously the Carlton very much, but how it all adapts, I'm not quite sure. I know where sort of we're going, yes, um, of course. but we don't, you know, to do an online competition, which is brilliant the way we, 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 we designed it last year means that we can have record applications and, and the judges can all judge online. We're not, facing the public so we don't have that bit to worry about just yet super thank you so much robert i'm um, david meany how has this sort of affected sort of travel and what what you've seen yeah so i work for the travel corporation which is a family-owned business of 42 different travel brands so yeah the core function of our business is group touring and obviously there's been a huge huge impact um so the biggest challenge is initially we're safely returning our thousands of travelers home from the various countries mm -hmm. that they were traveling with us and um, we initially cancelled all operations globally until the end of april and that's now been extended to july 30th or sorry june 30th at the moment um, which as you can imagine the biggest challenge then was managing the huge influx of calls and to our call centers and, the, and you know responses on our social channels around what this means for people and their trips um, and what we've then had to do is extend all of our policies in terms of um, we've been offering future travel credit and on the back of that we've been extending the period when people can rebook to and that's actually been extended until December 2022 um, and what we're seeing initially was around kind of 55% of people were accepting the future travel credit, but that's significantly increased now. So in the month of April, we averaged at 90% accepting future travel credit, and that allows them to travel, as I said, until the end of 2022. Um, so that's a bit of a positive news story. Um, but yeah, the challenge is kind of managing that huge volume of calls and you know that's only cancellations up until the end of june as you can imagine um as that extends further into peak summer the volume is going to increase even further certainly yeah. um, and, and i would imagine some of that is with call centers being closed as well i would imagine I, I <clears throat> people may be taking calls from home. yeah um yeah staff working from home and then trying to manage you know all of that is is increasingly difficult for, for managers yeah Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, can I ask uh, Wei, how, how have you been managing over the last couple of months? Yes, it's, uh, it's challenging uh, because we are one of the biggest high education institution providing hospitality uh, mm -hmm. courses in this country. Um, so suddenly we needed to transfer all the teaching from face to face to remote teaching. So this uh, transformation is uh, very swift. And uh, also considering uh, such as 60% of our students, for example, what I'm in teaching are international. Yes. So uh, many of them are from such as China, India, Vietnam, Thailand, different countries. Mm -hmm. Many of them have gone back home or some of them are staying here. 
So a lot of uncertainty. And they are the, what we call the, the future talent for the international hospitality industry. So we try to provide uh, the same quality, high quality teaching during this period of time. So a lot of uh, new method has to be developed and delivered to our students. So this is, uh, is one part of our job to do in these two months. And uh, certainly what I find is, uh, um, yes, it's like a reset button for the higher education sector as well in the hospitality industry. And we, it make us think, um, can we have another route to deliver training and the higher education? And it's, it looks quite possible, oh. even in this autumn, we're going to do a lot of teaching online. Um, Second the challenge is recruitment. So we depend on students and the international market is so important. So we look very closely what's happening in the global market. Um, such as China is one for our, certainly is, is the biggest market for our international market. We, we look closely and uh, in February and March, it's really, really, really bad. But uh, from April to May, we can see the confidence slowly mm -hmm. growing back. So we, we are pleased to see um, the recruitment numbers is going up in the past month because the hospitality and the tourism industry recovering in East Asia um, is a gathering pace. And so we, we expect 50 to 70% of the targeted, uh, like uh, our customers, will come back to university in the international market. That's what we hope. But certainly, we need to develop more new products and be innovative, try to provide the best products and the service to our students and, uh, and the, you know, to give them the same experience in terms of uh, hospitality education. Yeah, it's a real, yeah. real yeah. Certainly. Um, John, have you had much contact with, with hotels that have um, been asking you lots of questions of how exactly they're going to make this all work? Uh, well, it might not surprise you to hear that, yet, yes, we have. Um, certainly, and I think I touched upon this with uh, Andrew in a chat we had yesterday, that uh, in, in the initial stages of all of this, uh, there was a lot of work to be done, um, particularly in terms of keeping clients informed and updated. Um, uh, now, we thought that was for the initial period, but, but uh, um, I think as David touched upon, um, we, I, I think, have now had eight iterations of government guidance accompanied by a set of treasury directions which aren't on all fours in key respects with the actual government guidance in terms of furloughing staff. Um, and the government liked to keep us um, on our toes, let's say, with uh, <laughs> some key points such as uh, can, you, can you ask your uh, employees who you furlough to use up their annual leave or would you prefer that they have a good few months off and then come back having banked all that annual leave and then you've got a huge headache to mm. deal with. Um, so we were very busy at the, at the uh, initial stages and thereafter with uh, keeping on top of the guidance ourselves and then, and then answering client queries. So we, we did a lot of uh, webinars um, and I think we've probably moved now from, from that. We think we know where we are or thereabouts with most of the key points. Um, to now looking at, at unfortunately the post furlough landscape in hospitality as well as other areas because bluntly um, a lot of businesses are not going to emerge from this in the same shape that they were in pre furlough. Um, so we're now looking at uh, preparing businesses for restructuring, um, advice on redundancies. Um, I've had two calls in the last two days uh, with um, clients looking at actually. Uh, taking the advantage now 
and taking the steps, the first step towards redundancies rather than waiting to the end of the scheme, which is probably from a commercial perspective, the sensible thing to do. Um, not good news for employees eh, in, in some cases, sadly, but yeah, I mean, the, it's, no, uh, it's, it's not news to us, I think, that the hospitality sector has been impacted upon this, uh, by this, possibly worse so than, than any other sector. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, I mean, the, 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 and again, Andrew and I touched upon this, on this yesterday, the, the impact is not just um, immediately commercial, but they're cultural. I mean, how businesses will emerge from this. If we look at support staff, for example, in the hospitality sector, uh, faced business development is going to have to change, certainly for the foreseeable future. Face-to-face -face meetings are going to have to change. What impact does that have in terms of interacting with your workforce? Uh, not as regularly as you would have done before. Um, we, we will see differences in terms of a, um, well, when, when hotels and hospitality establishments be open, will, will they have lost key talent already? Particularly on the, um, on the support side. You know, well, John, I would, I would sort of say, and, and, and the, sort of the, the next question was really about that kind of a, a, attraction and retention of talent and how, how really will COVID-19 affect that in the, in the longer term, certainly for hospitality and for, for, for travel, because it's, and, and way it, you, you've mentioned it a little bit as well in terms of that recruitment for, for, for universities. But John, would you have any, any sort of thoughts on that and how sort of long term that might affect? Yeah, well, I, I think the, 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 the main risk at the moment is with the loss of key talent where there are, there are skills transferable uh, immediately beyond the sector. So if we look at uh, business management and support functions internally, general management, that, that sort of area, HR indeed, um, these are areas where uh, key members of staff can move from one sector to another quite easily. Um, where you have very skilled uh, chefs, for example, and um, possibly not so easy to move right now because the whole sector is affected by the same situation, but there will be opportunities moving uh, forward, no doubt. Um, so I think that the key risks at the moment are with those areas where the hospitality sector could lose um, very skilled and able um, support uh, functions to other to other sectors. Um, how do we retain those staff? Well, I think the key thing is about communication and reassurance at the moment, letting your staff know um, where the business sits, what's, what's planned. Um, there are all sorts of novel, I mean, they say, you know, uh, necessity is the, the mother of invention and the sorts of things we've been hearing from clients, you know, online yoga classes and interaction and uh, uh, socialising in, in groups over Zoom that simply wouldn't have happened before. So in some respects, it's increased. But um, I think keeping in touch, good communication are the, the key things right now in order to try and reassure your, your skilled uh, staff base. Yeah, I think so. Um, and David, um, just a couple of months ago, you probably would have been worried about the effect that the UK's withdrawal from Europe was going to have. But now the situation is changed quite dramatically. What, what, what do you think, how is it going to affect it, maybe in the traction in, in short term, but also uh, the retention of talent that is there at the moment, aside from the sort of the, sort of the shorter term financial impacts? I think I, I, anecdotally, I actually also hear about many people who are from uh, abroad going, going back home and not planning to come back. So yeah. I actually think there's an issue of, of what happens next year with Brexit and that issue compounded together and as John says, people leaving the industry. But I think there, is a, there are a lot of issues coming with that. Um, but all I would say, though, is that this is, this, is, this is temporary, this situation. So, you know, we are going to bounce back. Hospitality will bounce back. People intrinsically like to do things with each other. They like to go out together. They like, they like to eat together. They like to drink together. Um, I don't know about you or here, but I really quite miss going to the pub <laughs> with, with friends and family. It's one of the things I really miss being able to do. So I think intrinsically, <laughs> there's, a, there's a, a big desire amongst um, the population of the UK to support hospitality because we like we like hospitality. So I think there is a there is a bounce back for us. Uh, but yes, I, I think the point about losing staff is, is a real a real concern. Um, and I think we're going to have to look at how we can try and dip into other industries and other sectors and in, in, in what to do. 
Um, I mean, I read lots of information and lots of uh, content around now being in a completely digital environment with recruitment and onboarding. Uh, so, you know, how can you now look at social media um, strategies that, that piece together the four main platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, and the more newer, more focused platforms but also to help try and try and find staff. So I think there's going to be, a, as I think John was saying, necessity of mother invention. Yes, we're now need to really rethink, rethink how we actually um, get our vacancies out there and get what it's like to work for the industry out there to, to, to more people. Um, but be in the mindset that this will, we will, we will, we will get through this, and we will reopen. That's going to 100 mm -hmm. happen. And I think that keeping in touch with your, you know, your your alumni workforce um, is, is critical. So if someone does decide to move out of HR and go into financial services, just keep in touch with them and then bring them back because they're going to learn loads of great things there to bring back into their role in HR and hospitality, which may make them a more, um, whatever, well-rounded professional. So I think there's lots that we can we can do around that, but um, yeah, I, I, I think this is a, it's a new norm, and, and we need to get used to it. And I, I think um, there's a you know, big part of HR needs to play in that in that process around making uh, making the employee experience a lot more personalised for people, and not just rolling out an intervention, but actually thinking how we can personalise this intervention to really make it mean something to people that work for it. So I think there's lots of interesting things to, to think about with it. Yeah. Certainly, thank you. And uh, Robert, um, you mentioned that you're you're launching the Young Chef and Young Waiter competition. Certainly, going to help um, celebrate um, people who are doing amazing things in the industry. Is there anything else, or is there anything more you'd like to add on that, or is there anything else that you think that we should be really concentrating on and attracting and 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 developing people in the industry now? I think um, what you just said. You know, I mean, technology is amazing. Look, I, I'm I'm. I've learned more about technology in the last three weeks on an Instagram account that I've sort of fired up and rolling along with my, have my wife than I have in the last three years. So, you know, you've got to really develop. I'm not, I'm not terrible at it, but I'm a lot, I'm certainly a lot better now than I was three weeks ago. <clears throat> and um, a, a dear friend of mine, John, uh, John Vincent, who owns um, or part of the owners of, 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 of Leon said, do you remember when, high rates, business rates, and Brexit was an issue. I mean, you know, we'd have that today, wouldn't we? You know, with all the other stuff going on. So, um, uh, so you know, we go back to what, what we're doing. So it, it's about really, it, it's so difficult to say what is going to happen at the moment, tomorrow, almost. It's, it's a weekly update. We have these weekly updates with, UK hospitality to actually, Kate Nichols has been absolutely amazing, I have to say. Uh, she has been uh, brilliant at getting the information out to us. Um, and, but it is a, it's daily changing, weekly changing. So mm. uh, it's so difficult to say how it's all gonna go forward uh, and our timescales. Um, David, you're absolutely right. You know, we're desperate to bounce back. We're desperate. I called it, I wanted to call it um, VC day the other day, victory over Corona, but we're not quite there yet, you know. Um, and, uh, but when we can do it safely, uh, and the key is coming back from what I've got, and again, you guys are probably more knowledgeable because you're right on the front line with it uh, a lot of the time with, if your staff are safe, then your customers will be safe. Mm -hmm. So it's geared, it reminds me of the smoking days when it wasn't about, you know, whether you wanted to smoke or whether you are, it was all about the staff. If the staff are safe, then, then, then the customers will be safe. So that seems to be the message. If you can cook safely, you can probably serve safely. Um, and that is going to develop quickly. Now I've just seen a literally a text come through from BBC that a, a vaccine or something has, I've got something quickly flashed up there. Now, you know, these things are going to happen or things are going to happen really quickly. And when you think of all of the safety measures we're going to have to be taking right now uh, and the money that somebody's got to spend, these big companies have got to spend on these safety procedures, which they have to do, how long is that going to be relevant for if, if all of a sudden there is a vaccine September, whenever, who, who knows mm -hmm. when it's going to be, or other testing mechanisms that all work so it's just so difficult isn't it to say all we can just do is we go 
we know that we've got a few weeks to prepare because we know that they've said from July, whether it's the first or whether it's the middle of July. And um, that gives us a bit of time. And through this period, we're going to be another six weeks on. We're going to be, in a, I believe, it's almost going to be a completely different place again. Um, and so it, it, all I know is that what, what, what we're doing is trying to keep, you know, one, keep the spirits of the young talent up, which is out there, which is sitting on their butts at the moment, or I hope unless they're out, you know, <clears throat> picking asparagus or apples or something or whatever it is. Well, not apples yet, but certainly asparagus, which I saw people doing. I thought, brilliant, you know, go and do a uh, great exercise. I, I haven't got an asparagus farm here. and I haven't actually got time because I'm doing Zooms every day, but um, but love that. And, and I quite like the fact that, you know, they can be furloughed and yet they can go and do that or they can go and do other jobs and get paid for that. So if you really use your initiative and you really think, right, I'm going to get off. I'm not going to watch the TV. I'm going to say something else. Then, but anyway, we're not going to watch the TV. Uh, I'm going to get out there and I'm going to go and do something, whether it's stacking shelves in Morrison, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter what it is, but you can get paid for that as well. So mm. on that basis, you know, you, you, you could, Double your income, I presume. I mean, you know, I think about the parade on people's CVs as well when they do come yeah. getting new jobs or things like that. Anyone who has sort of proved what they've managed to do during this period of time, I think it's going to be. But also keep active, you know, don't. I mean, even if you were going to help the NHS and even if you're sitting on a phone, that equally would, would be seen, as you say. I mean, <clears throat> I've not really thought about that, but Michael, that would be brilliant if that was on your CV that through this period you were working and you were helping NHS and you were doing it voluntary, you know, brilliant. And, and also it keeps this going because, you know, but I haven't actually seen much of that. And I, I'm sure the other guys haven't seen much of uh, a lack of motivation. I haven't felt that at all, not within our sector, not at all. So again, I, I'm only going from where, what, I, what I hear, but I'm, I'm feeling, you know, I've got the excitement of the, of the industry about the launch of Young Chef, Young Waiter. It comes out of saying, Cater tomorrow, then it'll go all round with, with lots of brands supporting this competition because it supports the future of our industry. And it's also supporting people right now whilst, whilst they're at home. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Wei, um, have you seen this sort of level of enthusiasm still with, uh, with sort of students that you might be in, in, in touch with? Um, from my experience, okay, I noticed that there are two things. Firstly, is uh, such as in the hospitality industry, they still want to keep the future talented people and uh, the future managers for this industry. Because we have a lot of students have applied for placement year. Mm -hmm. And uh, in such a difficult time, I assume some of them will lose the opportunity to work in the industry as a placement student full time. But actually, which surprised me is many hotel groups such as married hotels, RHG, they still provide the opportunity to all students which is uh, quite uh, surprising, and but it's really positive to, to, to our students because they think, that, okay, um, you know, there are still um, chance for them to 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 apply the knowledge in the in the in the in the industry. Mm -hmm. Another thing I think uh, quite uh, significant for the industry is the government um, has. Uh, changed the visa policy related to international students. So for any students come to UK to study, no matter undergraduate or postgraduate degree, they can apply for uh, the PSW visa, which is a post-study visa, which means they can work, they can find a job, a full-time job after the graduation. So for example, um, for master degree students, if they come to UK to study, such as our course this September, and the next September they can apply for a job to work in mm. hospitality for the industry, which is a big boost for the industry to mm -hmm. keep uh, 
talented people. So um, what I find is, uh, such as India, for our Indian market, this is a key factor. Many young people from India, they want to come here to study and also to work in the industry. In the meantime, there are many other um, students from different parts of the world. They would like to work in the industry in the UK for a period of time. So um, I think it is, you know, uh, good news for students and for the industry. If you are looking for motivated young people with knowledge and commitment, you have a, a big pool to choose, no matter which sector they want to get involved. Mm, super, thank you, Wei. Um, David Meany, do um, you have any thoughts on this? Yes. So again, touching on the topic of young people, we would have a lot of younger people running our trips, trip um, drivers and tour guides. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to keep them motivated when they're out of work by our CEO doing daily video updates and moving our conferences that would have been face-to-face -face conferences to, to virtual conferences. Mm -hmm. So weekly trainings that are going out. And I think the reality is that um, I think, John, you mentioned that we're not going to be going straight back to those huge industry events. So actually, you know, getting our heads around this virtual trainings and conferences and product launches is going to be kind of how we are operating, I'd say, for the next year. Um, so that's kind of close of, of where we're going. I think the point around that, David, you raised around, you know, what we're all doing during this pandemic is going to really stand to all of us as we go forward. I can imagine these being questions at interviews in the future. You know, what was your own personal kind of COVID-19 journey and how did you navigate it on a personal level, but also on a professional level? So I think um, ensuring that our teams are engaged and working on fulfilling projects during this period is really important to, in terms of retention um, in the industry. Mm, definitely. Um, the question, uh, um, a recent Deloitte article um, recently described resilience as being able to not just recover to where it was, but catapult forward quickly. How, so how can the hospitality and travel industries take this opportunity to build resilience into what they do? And maybe we start that one with, uh, with Wei. Sorry, Wade, yeah. Yes, that's fine. Um, tourism and the hospitality industry is very sensitive, but it is resilient. So I think everybody has this very strong demand for tourism and hospitality products and service. So I think it's, uh, uh, how can we adjust our uh, business model to meet customer needs. So, especially during this period of time, the pandemic for many business, no matter SMEs or large hospitality company, you need to respond very quickly, but also in the long term, we have to follow the trend. Um, certainly, a lot of things going on, but what does uh, make me think is, for example, many restaurant businesses um, now pay attention to take away delivery service. <laughs> and, uh, this, is, this is because, uh, for example, I stay at home. I cannot go to restaurant now, but I still want to have, uh, have uh, nice food. So that's why I, I, I use my application and, and I try to order food for my family. So I think it's, um, it's how can hospitality business find the best way to, to deliver the, the product to customers. Um, very interesting, certainly what I can see is uh, no matter uh, the, you know, the situation, when there are gaps and the niche market for, for hospitality business. So for example, certainly such as the platform online ordering platform, uh, like Deliveroo or Just Eat or Uber Eats, they are very big companies. But what I noticed, for example, in Sheffield, the local taxi company, 
they also provide the deliver delivery service for all the families. Mm. And uh, the benefit for this taxi company to provide the service for customer is they don't take any commission from uh, the restaurant or takeaway. No oh, wow. Yeah. They they only charge customers mm. four pound ninety nine. Okay. So for many small businesses, for many small restaurant or cafe, they don't need to worry too much about the very hefty commission for the big platform they are going to charge. Many of them close to 30%. But uh, such as the local tax company, they make the business very simple. You don't need to pay any fees. We will help you to collect the money, we deliver the food, and uh, you get what you need. You okay. get the, you know, you, what you want to charge. So it makes the system quite simple. So, they, so these are small businesses to help small businesses. Hmm. And uh, certainly there are some other platforms that are not as big as uh, um, Deliveroo or Uber <laughs> Eats, but they can they try to find, find the small gap. For example, there are platforms dedicated to, to provide a service for international students ordering food because they have provided some language help and they provide some of the um, other very like payments which is related to the original country. So what I think is uh, it is a reset button and um, we need to be very agile and flexible and to be very uh, um, alert about the customer trend and the final gap for our business. That's interesting, the comment on, on um, agility and flexibility. I, I'm seeing a huge amount of innovation going on at the moment across the industry, across all industries. We, we work in other industries as well, and everyone's thinking innovatively about how we can, A, keep going, and B, uh, resurface from this. And the, the other thing that one or two of you have made a comment on, I think, is, is the accelerated digital transformation that's going on. Um, you know, how are we going to do show rounds when people can't can't go into a property? Well, maybe there are digital platforms that were actually already available that are just being accelerated into the marketplace. So there's some really interesting, exciting opportunities for everyone going on there at the moment, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Um, David Meany, um, do you have any, any thoughts on this, on, on yeah. how we're going to build resilience? The, the Travel Corporation is like a family-owned business. Of a, it's a hundred years old, and what I'm hearing now is it's more like a, a startup mindset. It's really, you know, going back to scratch. If we were to, you know, be building all, all of these brands from scratch, what would that look like? And it's literally taking out that blank sheet of paper and and no ideas off the table. So it's quite refreshing actually to to see that level of of innovation coming into a business that's been around mm -hmm. for for so many years. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, we're all having to pivot and like, we're very much so an international tour operator that would take travelers from the US and Australia or Canada, mainly English speaking markets, primarily to Europe, but, but globally as well, but primarily the businesses in Europe. And now we're beginning to look at, okay, well, we have huge audiences in Australia and the US and New Zealand. What can we do to target them right now with domestic products? So we're kind of pivoting and shifting what we're, we're offering to ensure that we we have something um, in the market. Um, and what we are also seeing in trends in terms of what people are searching for is um, that that kind of more conscious travelers. So last year we were seeing a lot more of the trends around conscious travel, people looking for experiences or attractions that support local people or the planet, or the wildlife in the places that they go to. And I think on the back of this, that people are gonna come out of this a bit more compassionate and actually really want to invest their dollars on, on their vacations into travel brands and travel services or um, hospitality that, that is giving back to the community. So I think that that's something that will hopefully come, continue to grow and come out as a benefit from all of this. Wonderful, yeah, we, we have certainly heard heard that before on, on previous episodes of the of the of Swede series we talk, talk about people really wanting to 
um, maybe sh 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 less short trips, more longer trips where they really kind of experience um, areas and, and, and are very considerate about the environment and the changes that are sort of happening almost naturally with, uh, with COVID. Um, John, do you have any, any thoughts on this, on, the, on the, how building resilience in the, in the industry? Um, I mean, I, I, think, I think it comes back to, uh, for me, from an employee relations perspective, get communication. Um, there's a lot of concern, I think, across various sectors right now, but particularly in office-based sectors, if I take that as an example, or, or, or coming back to the support uh, functions, where uh, over the basis on which we will return to work, so how will that change? Uh, to give you an example, offices with various floors, there's talk about banning interaction between workers on different levels in order to minimize traffic, whether that will be a long-term or a short-term solution uh, is unknown. Um, there will be obviously the, 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 the more obvious say, um, measures like uh, hand sanitizers at various points and, and things like that. But the dynamic within the workplace is going to, to change. And in terms of office environments, uh, and indeed uh, in, other, in other sectors, uh, non-office environments, the basis on which employees will come back to work will be key to keeping them and to keeping that building resilience, but also keeping businesses prepared to be resilient in the future, if I can put it that way. Employees have to know that when they come back to work, they will be safe. And so they have to understand what measures will be put in place. So communication is key for that. And I think keeping that uh, common and frequent to, to make your staff feel valued will be key to building that resilience on a longer term basis for, for businesses. Definitely, definitely. I think and the Edelman Trust or Edelman did a, did a sort of a trust barometer um, over about 10 countries. And they said, um, just on the point you're making there, about 63% of people uh, across those 10 countries would trust their employer versus only 58% who would trust their government and 51% trusting the traditional media. So there definitely there's a, there's a trust element to that communication as also. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. We're really kind of coming to the end. Um, but on, on that question of, of, uh, of building resilience and trust, um, David, would you have any, any thoughts? Um, I guess maybe I, I look at this also from a, a personal uh, individual perspective too. And um, I read about um, uh, advocating something called post-traumatic growth. So mm. quite inelegantly, it doesn't give me, it makes me stronger. And there's a really great quote that I read, which, which was, um, to experience a crisis is to inhabit the world that is temporarily up to grabs. I think it's really nice. It's from a, a, a um, political economist called William Davis. Oh, and I suppose when I, when I looked more, more at this question, I, I, I thought, you know, what, what could we perhaps be getting out there as a message to individuals? It's simple things like um, getting enough sleep and, and exercise and um, getting out and about, as people were saying in the call earlier on. And your mind and body really does start first. Um, then it's about not letting in negative thoughts derail your outlook on things. Uh, there's, there's wording around something called cognitive restructuring. So, yeah, looking at negative situations and and making sense of those and making sense of bad events and making the customer more positive. I think the issue around maintaining perspective is really key. And we've been talking about the fact this is a, a temporary issue in the industry that we will get over, uh, but will make some amazing um, uh, learnings and changes along, along, along that journey. But it does a lot of it comes back down to, to relationships and having relationships with, with your colleagues at work, with your manager at work. Um, the communication piece is, is, is really, really key, I, I think, for everybody. Uh, and I think, yeah, I think we'll, we'll look back at this, uh, this period and think, well, what did we learn through the, through the madness of, of Q2, Q3, mm -hmm. Q4, 2020? Um, and I think we'll all be naturally resilient because of it. I think we're all going to pick up those, those skills in some way. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And I um, mean, Robert, to, to finish up, we, we, we have uh, we, we've been through a lot of things before, a lot of sort of crises before in the hospitality industry, and it's always sort of come back. Um, do you have any thoughts on this uh, point of resilience? I think that I think we are. I, I've been in this industry for a long, long time, and I love. Uh, I love the sector. I love the industry. We're a passionate industry. We're a really hardworking industry, and I love that that old army term: improvise, adapt, and overcome. And I think that's exactly where we are, and we'll come bouncing back. Uh, you know, we are. 
we have everything, we have all the tools, we have great people, we are, London is recognized, and the UK, London recognized as the hospitality capital of the world, you know, people will be desperate to come back to us as much as we'll be desperate to travel and go to Greece, I hope. Uh, I want to go there in July, that's my plan, but whether I'm going to get there or not. <laughs> but um, yeah, I have no doubt we will be bouncing back um, as soon as we possibly can. And like you, whoever, I think David, I'm desperate to get down the pub. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great note um, in terms of positivity and, and this has been an interesting journey for us. We've, this is the fifth of our, our um, lockdown um, conversations, sweet series conversations, and it's moved from being very concerned at the start to, okay, we're managing this. And, and now I'm actually feeling quite a significant positivity mm -hmm. around the room, um, which, yeah, it's tempered with, with there, are, there, are, there are issues around, obviously, for all of us, but there's uh, some real positivity. Um, yeah which I think is great. Well, thank you, um, all of you, uh, for joining us today. Um, hopefully, we, um, you, you will have got some sort of uh, learnings from us, but uh, sharing all these stories certainly, I think, helps spark ideas and sparks um, ways to get over and get through what we're, what we're going through at the moment. But thank you so much for being with us. And Pleasure. Thank you again. Thank you. Can, can, I make thank a, you can I make a suggestion? We all meet at the pub at some point. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Depends. Well, you're in Edinburgh. Right? <laughs> Come on up. Come on yeah, up. Okay. It's a pub call. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.